Good morning and welcome all to a master class jointly organized by Clear Eyes and Oxford University Plus. Today, uh, the topic of the master class is on the current perspectives of internal security and disaster management in India. And I am extremely glad to invite the speaker of today's session, uh, Mr. Syed Wakhar Rasa, IPS. He is a 2007 batch IPS officer of West Bengal Kedar. He is also the author of the book. Internal Security and Disaster Management, published by Oxford University Press. So to say more about uh, Mr. Rasa sir, uh, he, uh, he has served different positions in, in Indian Police Service and he is having an experience of nearly 15 years. He has served as the Deputy uh, Commissioner in Kolkata. He served as Super uh, Intendant of Police uh, in several districts in uh, Calcutta. And currently, he is serving as the Joint uh, Commissioner of Police Organization in Calcutta. His interest includes uh, the latest technologies, artificial intelligence, cryptography, etc. He is also a fitness freak. And I am extremely glad to hand over the session to uh, Syed Wakar Rasa Sar, IPS. Thank you, Alex. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, you are audible. Thanks for the okay. generous, thanks for the generous introduction, Alex. And uh, I'm so glad to be here amongst the participants, among the students. Uh, I hope my voice is clear. Excellent, sir. Your voice is clear. Okay. So, friends, uh, 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 I welcome you to this uh, PPT or to this uh, lecture or to this master class on uh, on to, on dimensions of inter internal security and uh, the challenges that India faces today. And in this class, basically, I have organized the session into two parts. In the first part, uh, I'll be just briefly speaking about the importance of internal security and uh, how to prepare about the topic and uh, some general tips about answer writing and all. And that will take me about uh, 15 minutes or so. And for the next 40, 45 minutes, I'll be uh, speaking on two major internal security challenges that India faces today. And those two are left-wing extremism and uh, and uh, and Northeast, uh, uh, challenge in the Northeast. So friends, you would appreciate that uh, uh, there have been a lot of questions in the past on left-wing extremism and also a few questions on the Northeast. Uh, so I think after attending these lectures, you will yourself see that you are able to understand the questions and you are able to answer better, uh, to frame better answers for the same. So friends, uh, 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 Alex, should I start, uh, share the screen now? Yeah, you, you may please share this lecture. Okay, thanks, thanks, Alex and uh, friends. Uh, so this is a this is a uh, talk on the internal security and disaster management in India, the current perspective. So I will not be able to cover the entire spectrum of all all internal security challenges, but I will mainly be focusing on two of the important, as I mentioned, left wing extremism and uh, and and India's the challenges in the north. So friends, uh, before I start, there's a small disclaimer because I'm, I'm a government officer. So uh, the views are my personal views and they do not represent the views of government of India or the government of West Bengal or any other government agency. And the issues are purely for academic purpose and uh, to help the aspirants uh, during their exam preparation. The speaker does not intend to criticize not, uh, or he does not uh, criticize nor intends to criticize any government policy. So friends, uh, these, uh, these, the material has been taken from uh, my book on internal security and uh, you can see on the right side of the screen uh, and uh, there's a link also. And these are the contents. Uh, basically, I'm just going through the content so that you'll understand the, uh, the, 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 uh, the breadth of the subject of internal security. The first one is linkage between development and extremism in which you know development and extremism are two, two sides of the same coin. And so this link has been developed in this chapter and beautifully explained in the next three, that is uh, Northeast, uh, Jammu and Kashmir, and uh, uh, left-wing extremism. So these are three case studies of the first chapter. Uh, and also these are the three important internal security challenges theaters in India. Then, then the book also explains uh, the role of external state and non-state actors. Basically, it is about terrorism, about UAPA, about the role of China, Pakistan, uh, ISI, various terrorist organizations, homegrown terrorism, and so on. So uh, then we have a chapter on challenges from media and social media. Of late, there have been a questions on uh, from social media and media also in the PC mains paper. And then we have an entire chapter on cyber security challenges, which includes uh, the latest guidelines of intermediate rules and all change. Uh, there's a chapter on money laundering, which there was last year a question on money laundering, I suppose. And uh, 
then there is an entire chapter on security challenges in the border areas in which we have discussed on, on the various borders for example pakistan china Myanmar, Bangladesh. So each one of these borders have a specific set of challenges and you need to understand the specifics of these borders and the challenges there to be able to frame answers uh, in your exam. Then we have a chapter on coastal airspace security. There was earlier a question, one or two questions on coastal security as well in the UPSC mains exam. Uh, then there is a chapter on organized crime and its linkage with terrorism. I believe this year also, last year also, there was a question uh, on organized crime and its linkage with terrorism. And then we have a uh, Chapter on security forces and security agencies. These include CAPF, CBI, RNAW, IP, and so, so many agencies uh, related to security. And then uh, these days, AFPA has become a very important. So, AFPA, there is an entire chapter and some issues related to AFPA, uh, related to arms forces, uh, like, for example, uh, uh, creation of theater, theater commands. And uh, recently, there has been a push on indigenization of weapons and uh, uh, and uh, and to reduce the dependence, uh, import dependence for arms and ammunition. So those things are covered in uh, this chapter. There's also a chapter on communalism and mob violence, and uh, in and there's a chapter on India's nuclear doctrine, COVID, and uh, non-traditional security challenges. For example, food security. For example, oil security, energy security, water security. These are also important aspects of uh, the internal security of a country. A country cannot be they considered safe if, if it is not safe from the food, if it is not sufficient, uh, self sufficient from the food point of view. You can look at the scenario in Sri Lanka nearby. So all these uh, non traditional security challenges, which in which there is a, there is no there is no military aspect, but nevertheless the problem is important. For example, if a nation is not secure from the energy perspective, it cannot be considered as uh, secure. Uh, it will be always vulnerable. Then there are two chapters on disaster management. The first one explains the various kinds of disasters uh, individually and gives uh, preventive mitigative measures for uh, disaster management. And the second part uh, deals with the various national, international, state level, district level bodies and laws, uh, etc. For uh, in, in, in India. And uh, the good picture is that uh, the, the last year's questions have been uh, <clears throat> discussed and covered in the book through, the, through a QR code. Also, some of the um, important keywords have been highlighted throughout the book and each at the end of each chapter, you have a one or two page gist of the um, contents of chapter so that while just before the exam, you cannot read the entire chapter. So you can read uh, just those few pages and uh, ensure that your revision is passed. So that's uh, uh, a few lines about my uh, book uh, coming to the next slide, friends. And uh, Alex, I will just uh, interject if I'm going too fast, please pause and uh, tell me because sometimes I do tend to speak a little bit fast. Sure, sir. Yes, please, great. I mean, it's, it's okay. Perfect. Right. Thank you. Friends, uh, uh, internal security and disaster management portion is a very uh, important portion these days. You will see there are a lot of questions. Uh, last year, for instance, in the mains, uh, I think there were about seven questions totaling 85 marks in paper three. Uh, also, uh, internal security will be helpful in uh, the prelims exam. A lot of questions from here and there because in prelims, there is no fixed syllabus, uh, every, anything and everything can be asked. But yes, you have to follow certain uh, guidelines, you have to follow standard textbooks, and you have to follow uh, uh, notes of institutes like uh, CLIA IS. Uh, so uh, friends, uh, this internal security portion and disaster management portion is, uh, is very important, but it is easy also. You should not think that uh, uh, the questions are very difficult. Questions are, if you have a certain level of preparation, you will be able to frame your answers in the question. I'm sure uh, in the in the subsequent slides there will be questions also of the past years, and you will see after the end of this session, uh, I'm sure you will be able to frame the answers related to these two topics, that is LWE and uh, and, and and the Northeast. You can carry it as a test as a test for yourself. So uh, just hold patience for about one hour or so, and I'm sure you will be benefited in these two topics. Uh, so, uh, friends, uh, not only uh, prelims and uh, prelims and mains, but this topic also is important for uh, essay. Sometimes you you tend to get uh, essays related to internal relations and maybe technology, maybe cyber security, maybe uh, social media. Uh, so all these things are uh, relevant. Uh, so so your uh, your efforts in internal security will be helpful in your other papers also. For example, essay maybe maybe portions of science and technology. Maybe social issues because money laundering or maybe corruption, uh, uh, drugs. These are all social issues also. 
so and this is uh, quite a current based uh, uh, subject but if you know the basics of the uh, of the syllabus if you know what are the problems on india bangladesh border even if there are small changes in the current scenario by and large you will be able to have the whole grasp and you can frame the answers uh, so it is current based but still you should know the theory part of it and if you are sure with the theory part you will be able to frame the answers in the exam it's easy but you know at times uh, students do not uh, put the effort they just read some kind of a notes or something but they do not uh, go for uh, uh, they do not study in a systematic manner they do not have a textbook uh, maybe sometimes they just refer to some online material also and they ignore it and, and uh, which uh, because of which they are not able to answer the questions to the satisfaction of the exam so if you follow a standard textbook i suppose uh, uh, it will be much easier for you in the exam friends uh, and you have to supplement the answers with the uh, with the current events you have to uh, you have to for example if there is a question now on afspa you must also mention that in mon in nagaland there was a uh, there was a case of mistaken identity in which i think you know 16% civilians got killed and because of which now the scope of afspa has been reduced to uh, from earlier bigger area to now i think 31 districts in full uh, and several districts in part i think 12 or 13 districts in part in the four states in mon so Uh, uh, though you have to know the history of AFSPA and what are the laws and rules uh, regarding that, but still, if you can uh, add some current, the current, uh, the current uh, reference or the current uh, point for that, the, your answer will become richer. But you should also, before embarking on any topic, before starting any topic for UPSC, you should study the previous year's patterns. That will give you an idea how how to study, what is important, what is not important. and you should, and similarly for internal security also before you start uh, before you start studying just see so i have analyzed the paper and i have found uh, three four topics to be very important every year or two there are every year there are one or two questions on these issues and i will name them i think uh, lw is important lw every year or maybe it, after two years there is a question on lw uh, one of the most important topics is uh, border security challenges border security challenges almost every year you can expect a question or maybe Uh, every alternate year you can expect a question uh, so this is important also important is uh, is cyber security challenges because every year or so you will find this year also i think there was a question on uh, on a cyber security attacks from outside so cyber security also is important so if i am asked to name two three most important chapters i will say it is border security challenges and cyber security challenges and rest also important but and, and also money laundering money laundering every two three years you have a question lw is important so these four five chapters are very important the rest are uh, important but not as much as these uh, chapters are of course in disaster management this everything is important you have you have seen there are only two chapters it's easy not very difficult and if you can read it thoroughly you will be able to answer uh, the questions of disaster management just to be slightly precise uh, you have to study specific disaster wise in uh, disaster management and then of course the importance of practice uh, is uh, cannot be uh, cannot be uh, not be uh, reduced you have to practice writing the answers you have to practice uh, making uh, your answers better and better to get it corrected by by teachers and see what are the faults uh, i have come to a separate slide on how to write better answers but uh, uh, just for now uh, you have to practice keep on revising your portions so that you do not forget you know in upsc exam uh, suppose your exam is in uh, is is five or six months ahead and today if you are studying of course you will forget by that time you will forget what you had read so you always have to have a method of uh, revision uh, integrated with your study so whatever you study today you will forget in say 6 7 months or maybe 5 6 months after one year so you must have uh, maybe by underlining the book itself or maybe by making small notes whatever be your own specific method but you must always uh, keep in your mind how to uh, like for instance if you have read a paper you have read a chapter which is of 20 pages in the book now in the exam time you will not have 20 pages in 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 one or two days you have to revise three four subjects so you have to make small notes or maybe you have to write notes in the book itself whatever be your choice uh, of method but uh, you have to make sure that whatever you read you have yourself to uh, you have yourself to uh, ensure that uh, you are able to revise it in a in a, in a smaller span of time in my uh, book uh, i have number one uh, highlighted the important keywords so that while you are reading a chapter if you just flip the pages you know these are the five or 10 keywords uh, uh, which need to be remembered in this topic and at the end of the chapter you will also have Uh, one or two pages of revision uh, so that is my effort but of course you can tailor it for your own uh, needs friends uh, in this uh, slide i will be discussing a little bit about uh, alex uh, is there an issue 
uh, not a problem sir i mean some participants were saying that uh, the voice uh, is a little low but uh, okay. from my end i think the voice is clear i mean uh, maybe local issues uh, at at some participants and okay i'll I'll, I'll 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 try to move a little bit uh, closer to the uh, closer to my computer so uh, participants if there is a problem please feel free to uh, tell me i i see there are few questions but i believe uh, i'll be able to take the questions in the last only but uh, alex i will request you to keep track of the questions and in the last uh, maybe we can spare 10 15 minutes or uh, question and answer session uh, is my speed okay alex yeah your speed I, you are a little fast i guess but uh, that's okay that's okay. okay we also have to finish a lot of topics in the minimum time yes 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 so that is the reason so just uh, friends uh, just uh, stay put for uh, maybe half an hour or 40 minutes and i'm sure you will benefit it so friends uh, while writing answers there are a few things which i feel uh, are important uh, first and foremost in upsc now you have word limit so you will have to be very specific you will have to know about the subject you have to be very specific in the answer you cannot beat about the bush because the examiner is very smart he will see that uh, he will understand whether you know or you do not know the topic so uh, that is one thing uh, knowledge about the subject and then the second thing is uh, current developments have to be included i have spoken about this earlier as well friends uh, you have to stick to the time and word limit you you cannot afford to miss any questions uh, there are 20 questions i think uh, in this paper 3 as far as i know and uh, so whatever way you write uh, even if you write uh, slightly small or maybe uh, uh, do know you you should try never to miss a question completion of the paper is of prime importance if you write very good answers and you miss two answers you are out of the race so first and foremost you have to try to write fast and write and complete the paper and then of course you have to write legibly and neatly i'm sure i i i, I know everybody of everybody ca cannot have a very beautiful handwriting I myself do not have a very beautiful handwriting, but do try to write uh, clearly. That is something that we all can aspire to do because uh, having a beautiful handwriting is something that you can, you know, you develop in the childhood. But uh, but 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 now instead of trying to change the handwriting, you can just try to write slightly bigger and neater, so that when the examiner sees at the first instance, at the first glance, your paper uh, stands out. If there are a lot of cut marks, if there are a lot of scratches. So he gets put off, and uh, normally these people, the examiners are quite old, sometimes old. Their vision also is not very good, so they they are put off, and then and then say suppose he gives uh, out of ten, he gives five marks to you, and maybe to a good, good, uh, person whose paper looks good, he gives six marks. So it's only about one mark difference, but it's ten percent difference. In two thousand marks, it's almost about one, maybe two hundred marks difference. So uh, so try to write legibly and neatly. I'm not talking that you should have a very beautiful handwriting, but whatever handwriting you have, try to write big, try to write clear. Important keywords should be underlined. Uh, there are five or six keywords in an answer. Please underline those so that examiner doesn't have to read the entire thing. He just sees those keywords are present. He understand. He understands that okay, you know the topic. I'm sure uh, this is how you would be correcting your uh, papers in uh, your test paper, Alex, while the candidates are giving. Alex, uh, this is uh, how you were correcting the. This is how. You also correct the papers, right? By looking at whether the candidates have included the keywords. That, that's correct, sir. Yeah, right. mentioning important keywords are very, very crucial. That will help the examiner to, uh, I mean, go through the paper first. Yes. So, if possible, can uh, friends uh, do supplement them with diagrams, maps, and flow charts? It goes without saying. And then uh, for all these things, you have to keep on revising your contents and practicing writing answers. So everything comes with practice. Do not think that. Uh, you know this upsc is a is not a is not a very uh, is not a 100 meter kind of dash kind of thing it's a kind of marathon race in which you have to keep on putting small 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 efforts every day and it may it may take you one or two years but trust me friends uh, it's a very it's a very important phase of your life and you must try to put your best effort here there will always be days in which you will feel bad aaj padhai nahi ho pa raha hai aaj kuch problem ho gaya but then you know you have to maintain a certain minimum level of studies and there will be good days also in which you will feel very motivated and you will feel that you have covered your portions so you have to take care of uh, the thing that uh, on the bad days on the days in which you feel low you have to just maintain keep maintaining a minimum okay aaj bahut zyada padhai nahi hui hai today i have not studied uh, to my satisfaction at least i must not go beyond a level because what happens is once you go in a dip, kind of a depression cycle then you waste three four days and that is what take puts you off the track so so there will be good days in studies there will be days in which you are enjoying your uh, progress is good 
but they will also and it happens with everybody it happened with me it happened with him it happened with everybody so on the on on those days in which you are not feeling good just try to just try to at least study mechanically for those two three days and again after that it will be fine so uh, and it's a it's a long haul race uh, you have to put your you, you have to put a certain number of uh, you have to put certain efforts on a daily basis on a long term and this is the key to success there is no other key to success and of course practice once you are studying keep on writing your answers keep on getting them evaluated keep getting feedback that what is going wrong and after three four questions and test paper you see that you you understand what the examiner wants so with that your your level of uh, presentation improves the same question a person will know and the same answer uh, the topper will write and another person write there will hardly be much of difference but the topper is topper and this person may not be able to clear because his presentation was not good and how do you improve just by writing and getting it evaluated evaluated so friends uh, going to the next slide uh, so i'll just listed out what are the important terms into challenges you already know left wing extremism north east so i think friends this is the first part of the um, lecture now we will go to uh, gradually go to lwe and uh, the and, and north east extremism so these are the important internal security challenges left wing extremism north east insurgency jammu and kashmir Uh, terrorism and role of external state and non-state actors. Uh, security challenge in border areas. Coastal and ASP security. Cyber security challenges. Challenges from media and social media. Uh, money laundering, organized crime, and a few more. So I have could not include all of them on this slide, but these are the important security challenges that India faces. Today. Let's see what are the questions, friends. Uh, last year's questions. Uh, these are I have uh, these are uh, written very small. I hope they are visible to you. Uh, so just let me uh, read a few. This is about S four hundred defense air, and why why I am saying is I am analyzing what kind of questions are asked, and what is your what should be your level of preparation. There are certain uh, learning points in these questions, which is why I have uh, included this slide here. So what are the see just see what are the learning points? How is the S four air defense system technically superior to any other system? So first of all, you should know what is S four hundred defense uh, system. Then you should know why it is technically superior. Uh, so this was covered in my book on internal on the chapter on. Uh, uh, Air space security. So that was there already. Um, so how it is technically superior is what you have to write the plus points of that this four hundred years defense system. So my point is that it's related to science and technology. So while you study internal security, you are also preparing for science and technology. And uh, then the, let's go to the next question. Discuss the vulnerability of India to earthquake related hazards. Give examples including salient features of major disaster caused by earthquakes in different parts of India. So. it's about earthquake it's not about general disaster the point to that i am trying to make is while preparing for disaster management study specific disasters also and their their mitigation and prevent, prevention study just don't go study uh, having studied only disaster go for landslides go for earthquakes go for tsunami go for study uh, tropical cyclones uh, uh, study uh, urban floods study floods that's how you the uh, questions will be generally in upsc exam so Should be and that's how I have also mentioned in the first chapter in my book on disaster management. I have included all kinds of disasters and their related measures and all. And the second chapter I have gone for institutions and laws concerning disaster management. So friends, uh, discuss how emerging technology and globalization contribute to money laundering. Disc see the depth of the question. It's not asking about what money laundering is. It's asking how emerging technologies. What you have to answer is how uh, cryptocurrencies, how uh, things like cryptocurrencies are used to for money laundering. Because there is anonymity, there is uh, pseudonymity in cryptocurrencies and globalization. So money flows from here to there. A few days back, uh, this big uh, uh, Bitcoin exchange called uh, cryptocurrency exchange called uh, uh, Wazirx was uh, it was raided by uh, its account was frozen by ED for money laundering. Just about two days back, news. So friends, uh, so this is the question. Keep then the, going to the next question. Keeping in view India's internal security, analyze the impact of cross-border cyber attacks. So it's not about what cyber security is about. So you have to mention about what the role of China in uh, you know attacking sites, the role of Pakistan in defacing many sites. Sometimes China has uh, tried to attack. For example, there was allegation in uh, that the power grid failure in Mumbai about two years back. It was due to uh, some hacking from China. Uh, so so these are the things that you have to and dis also discuss defensive measures. In defensive measures. You have to write about uh, you know uh, increasing awareness, uh, tracking of malwares, uh, putting good defenses, keeping your systems updated, uh, and all these things. So uh, then again, uh, describe the various causes and effects of landslides. Again, uh, it's specific to a, a particular kind of disaster that is landslide. Mention the important component of national landslide risk management strategy. 
then analyze the multidimensional challenges posed by external state and non state actors to the internal security of india so multidimensional means external state and non state actors are state actors are china pakistan so what are the, their roles and non state actors are for example like isi various terrorist organizations these and also discuss measures required to be taken to combat these threats uh, analyze the complexity and intensity of terrorism its causes linkages and obnoxious nexus so you have to discuss about the linkages for example the same group of terrorists they they do terrorism as well as they deal in arms they deal in drugs they uh, they, they 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 do, do money laundering sometimes they they do they are involved in human trafficking at the border so these are the ob obnoxious link linkages of terrorism with uh, various crimes so uh, that is uh, that is the analysis of last year so the takeaway points is you have to be specific and uh, uh, the questions are also quite specific and quite deep uh, so uh, that's 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 the takeaway here friends so friends now we start with left wing extremism and uh, mm, i hope uh, I'm, i hope i'm uh, speed is fine alex yeah uh, this is much better sir you you are actually a uh, little slow if, if if that is the case <laughs> it's much okay. better but everybody is able to follow now okay thanks uh, candidates there are uh, many questions uh, i i assure you i have i have absolutely no constraint of time today is a sunday even if it takes one hour more i will clear all your doubts and questions so just keep writing and just have patience in the last i will answer all your questions don't worry every single question i will answer uh so friends uh, this is about left wing extremism and left wing extremism is one of the most important security challenges that india faces india faces today in fact in 2006 uh, prime minister manmohan singh he mentioned that it is uh, the single most important uh, internal security challenge that india faces and from then we i think we have progressed uh, a long way and today it is uh, quite under control or i think it is reduced in its size and all the area has shrunk so i'll discuss about all these things in the future slide just first understand what are the questions that have been asked on this topic uh, and see, see the depth of the question friends you cannot write the answers just by knowing what lw is you have to understand the entire context you have to understand what the government policy is what are the prongs of the government policy and then i'm sure whatever question they will ask you will be able to answer just wait for half an hour and you will see that you are able to understand this topic and then you can frame your own answers you know there are questions here for example the third question is uh, or the uh, fourth question is uh, a mixture of quality and internal security article 244 of the indian constitution relates to administration of scheduled areas and tribal areas analyze the impact of non implementation of the provisions of fifth schedule on the growth of lw so first you have to know what fifth schedule says and then you will have to say that okay these these things have not been fulfilled and these are the reasons for and you know for lw these are the very reasons for which lw uh, happens and then you will say that since the fifth schedule has not addressed these things therefore the lw has grown in these areas so you have to know also about uh, not only about lw but also about uh, article 244 and schedule 5 coming to the first question uh, what are the determinants of lw in eastern part of india bengal jharkhand odisha and so on yeah, what strategy should government of india civil administration and security forces adopt, adopt to counter the threat in the affected areas second question is lw is showing a downward trend but still affects many parts of the country briefly explain the government of india's approach to counter the challenges posed by lw uh, the third one is uh, a big question so uh, in the last it writes with malkangiri and naxalbari focus discuss the corrective strategies needed to win the left wing extremism doctrine affected citizens back into the mainstream of social and economic quite a big question uh, so this is the so the the learning point here friends is that the questions will be uh, slightly uh, not direct it will be if it is direct you are good you are happy if it just asks the government strategy you are good to go but if it asks a least linkage with say 244 or maybe uh, maybe with uh, with uh, with the development of large industries then you will have to have some uh, analytical understanding of this uh, whole thing and once you understand it analytically whatever question they pose i am sure you you'll be able to answer them so my uh, aim in this lecture is to give you that analytical understanding so that whatever question they pose you are able to answer after half an hour so friends just see this slide uh, uh, lwe actually uh, means left wing extremism and uh, the, the 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 goal of left wing and it's basically uh, they they influence from china from mao uh, mao zedong actually said that power flows from the barrel of the gun so if you control the barrel of the gun or you have a gun in your hand then you become powerful and you can capture the area 
so he said about uh, a protracted arm struggle protracted means long drawn and they called it protracted people's war so people's war is nothing but an arm struggle so the goal of maoist you sometimes you may wonder what is what is it that they want so they want to capture state power in india the power is in the hands of uh, the elected executive political executive the prime minister the uh, council of ministers the chief minister and so on so maoists want to capture state power by fighting uh, you know, by by uh, by fighting through guns so they they know that it will not happen in one day they know that it will take them 50 or 60 years so protracted is that term which is that it is it, it is a long drawn war protracted war it, they may they are willing to fight for 50 years uh, to get this thing they are not expecting that in 5 years or 2 years it will happen so they have fought for so long so friends uh, what happens in this slide i will be explaining how this entire uh, lwe thing works so you see the background it's a quite a hilly and forested area it's uh, it's not very developed the roads are not good not much of infrastructure can be seen here of course it is a forested and hilly area so uh, what happens is uh, they choose the maoists they choose uh, these uh, these underdeveloped areas and uh, they 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 actually they choose the most backward and inaccessible area so you know in those areas already there is a kind of feeling of deprivation or maybe discontent in the population and they actually try to use this existing discontent in amongst the people for their own goals and benefits and how do they do that so they raise issues of uh, forest uh, jal jungle zameen land displacement tribal uh, maybe industrialization all these local issues whatever is the local issue sometimes there is an industry uh, so they will uh, protest against the industry i'm not saying that uh, all displacement is good but then they do uh, identify what are the local issues and then based on those local issues they try to agitate and once when they agitate they try to uh, hold meetings in the village and they Uh, they actually uh, yeah, propagate their ideology they try to influence the people and sometimes uh, and then they start collecting taxes from them how taxes when i was posted in uh, way back in 2009 i was posted in jhargram uh, which is a subdivision in uh, pashchim bidnapur district of west bengal so that was my first posting and uh, that was immediately after uh, the lalgarh agitation and uh, so in those areas we used to go to villages uh, for cotton search operations and uh, maybe ambushes and all so uh, we 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 found that in the villages uh, the maoists used to collect uh, at that time i'm saying of 2009 uh, uh, or 10 maybe 10 perhaps 9 uh, so uh, in those uh, in those areas the maoists used to collect uh, 10 rupees from each household and 1 kg atta atta or chawal 1 kg atta or rice from each household and uh, and 10 rupees per month they would collect as tax so it was not a very big amount but people were constrained to give out of fear and not out of uh, not out of uh, you know uh, uh, that they are they are they, not out of concern but mainly out of fear sometimes when the people would not give or they would uh, and and also they would uh, so that is uh, how their their funding is sometimes they also the funding is also because of the forest uh, merchants and maybe those people who mine in these areas the industries in these areas they also are extorted otherwise they will fall bank cause damage in their factory so uh, that is how their funding works mainly it is local it is not some foreign funding kind of thing mainly it is from the local resources they will cut timber or maybe they will extort from the villages villagers extort from the business men in those areas so uh, after capturing after influencing the villagers they would go and see what is the problem that village if there is an allegation they would hold kangaroo court in the village so in the night they would go there and uh, and Uh, and 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 call the person and then they would uh, catch hold of a person and then they would uh, they would kind of hold up hold a court that was and then if the person is found guilty they would kill him immediately then and there at the spot so this would actually uh, make the villagers very very fearful of them and uh, so nobody would want to give any information about them and if one person is killed in the village the entire village falls in line they would not protest against them they would not give any information and the maoists have a free run in that area and then what they do is after this uh, sometimes they start attacking the police personnel you see in this uh, case i think a bus has been attacked a landmine has been planted somewhere here and it has uh, this is a mine protective vehicle and a landmine has has been uh, burst here properly and the bus has fallen in in the ditch and uh, <clears throat> so they they attack the police personnel government officer and why do they attack them uh, for two three reasons number one uh, to show their power to show their dominance uh, in the area number two to boost the morale of their cadres number three to uh, weaken the police number 4 to create administrative vacuum so that they can try to fill their administrative vacuum and they can they can try to capture power at a small level 
Uh, also, by attacking police personnel and government officers, those officers will not be willing. They will be demotivated to work in those areas. Governments, governance will become smaller. People will be more discontented, and then and then Maoists will step into to fill their uh, fill that vacuum. I have seen those areas. Some of those areas they have they had started opening uh, small uh, health camps and maybe rudimentary kind of hospitals because they had cut the access of uh, government in those areas and. Uh, trying to project that okay, see, we are looking after your welfare, and see, we have opened a small hospital dispensary kind of. So uh, that is how they work, and then they indulge in destruction of property, public property, like you see in this instance, the bus has been damaged. Sometimes they will blow up schools, colleges, mobile towers, and uh, you would wonder why. So uh, sometimes these school buildings are also used by security forces. So uh, they they damage these school buildings. The roads are damaged because if the roads are there. Immediately, the security forces can move and maybe launch an operation to catch them so that roads are, uh, they cut ditches in front of the road and so on. Uh, then, uh, they, uh, then uh, so this creates an administrative and political vacuum in the in governance. And uh, due to fear coercion, the local people are, 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 uh, are uh, forced to support them. And uh, they also launch something called a tactical counter offensive campaign, which is called a TCOC, tactical counter offensive campaign. And this is held between the months of, say, March to June, July, August, something like this, in which in these months, the jungle is uh, fresh leaves grow in the forest. Uh, so these leaves, uh, just after the spring season, so fresh leaves are there. So the jungle is dense. Uh, in, in before that, in winter, the leaves are not there. So if the Maoists move in the jungle, they will be visible. So they choose these months of uh, March, April, May, June. Because after that, in the rainy season, again, they will be able to not move in the jungle. So they, they use these three, four months to uh, launch tactical counter-offensive campaign in which they they attack the police stations. They do recruitment drives to motivate their uh, cadres. They launch uh, they launch attacks on the police forces. And you will see if you see data, most of these attacks are uh, during the summer months or maybe in these uh, three four months. That is called tactical counter-offensive campaign, and that is how the Maoists hold uh, they 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 gain control of the countryside. And after that, uh, there are more different organizations of Maoists which. Uh, which uh, which go around in the area in the urban areas and they try to project they they fight cases on behalf of the arrested Maoists they try to gather funding these are actually the intellectuals uh, they are uh, they are uh, they are they are sometimes called also referred as urban Naxals and uh, they try to arrange funding they also try to help the Maoists in recruitment they try to fight cases on their behalf uh, they try to propagate their ideologies uh, and so on so that is these are the role of front organizations I think four years back. Three years back, there was a question on role of front organizations also. So maybe mainly it is they, they are helpful in appropriating the ideology, fighting cases for them, arranging their finances, arranging rec uh, recruitment, recruiting more people for them, uh, using the democratic process for the benefit of the for their own uh, ideological uh, agenda, uh, using the democratic institutions, courts, and so on, the human rights, and so on. So this is the role of uh, front organizations, and uh, then these people, are the urban Naxals or the, the, the ideologues, they start uh, mobilizing the masses in urban areas and semi-urban areas, and uh, they also raise the issue of tribals, corporate exploitation, uh, human rights violation by security forces, and so on. And they also use the state machinery to further the Maoist agenda, and uh, so they provide sometimes recruitment, shelter also to some of the Maoists. Uh, assistance, legal assistance, funds, and so on. Maoists also have a strategic uh, tie-up with other insurgent groups. For example, in Northeast, they have a tie-up with the PLA of Manipur. PLA is of the same name, uh, People's Liberation Army, but it is not the same PLA as China. In Manipur also, there is a group called the People's Liberation Army, which is a valley-based insurgent group. Uh, so Maoists have tie-up with them. They, they, they sometimes procure arms from them and also receive trainings from them. And uh, they also have ties from some of the groups in, they had ties from some of the groups in Jammu and Kashmir also. And there's something called a C-Composa, which is uh, a coordination committee for Maoist parties of Southeast Asia. So the Maoists of uh, all South Asian, South Asian countries, they have a, they have a loose tie amongst themselves. Though they did not, it may not be very strong at this moment, but they are also trying to, they, are, they have also in the past tried to, uh, to, to, to gather some kind of a uh, uh, cooperate with the international other Maoist organizations, for example, in Nepal and so on. So, friends, uh, now we see what is the extent of Maoist extremism in India, and uh, you'll see uh, at present it is in 70 districts in 10 states. Earlier, the area was much bigger, it was almost entire this uh, whole thing, but now there are a lot of 
gaps in between. This map has been taken from, uh, I think, uh, South Asia Tourism Portal. And uh, uh, so this uh, 70 districts in 10 states, and these 10 states are Bihar, Jharkhand, Odisha, Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra, Telangana, AP, West Bengal, and Kerala. And in 2011, this number was 2,201 district in uh, 20 states. So you see from 201 districts, we have come a long way and now there are only about 70 districts which are affected. Most of them, this part remains a stronghold of them. And but LWE violence was reported only from 41 districts in, in 2020. So these uh, districts are there, but actual violence incident had taken place only in 41 districts in 2020. And, uh, and uh, most of these 25, 25 districts, that is those which are green or maybe yellow or orange, uh, red or orange or green, these are the districts in which uh, maximum number of 85% uh, of violence have taken. So to, to conclude friends here, uh, yeah, Maoist, uh, the, the geographical extent has reduced in the last 10 years or so, and uh, yeah, their intensity also have increased. I do not have, I have not included the, uh, the exact figures here, but they are in the book. And uh, so you'll see, the trend is declining. Um, a lot of people have been surren have surrendered. A lot of people have got killed. Um, a lot of people have surrendered. A lot of uh, incidents have come down. Uh, Warrant incidents have come down. Civilian killings have reduced. Security forces killed have reduced, and so on. But yes, in some areas, for example, in the Chhattisgarh, the last region called this, uh, this is your uh, Dantewada and all. In these areas, their their strength still remains, and that is the cause of concern. So I think I have gone through this slide, how dynamics of Maoist insurgency works. I will, I will skip this slide. I will also skip this next slide, which is what I have called about front organizations. I have called about C-Compos. I have talked about strategic unity front of the North Eastern German industry. I have all spoken about all these things while I was on the picture uh, slide. So what is the government's response for countering left-wing extremism, friends? Uh, government of India, the approach is four pronged. First and foremost, government tries to improve the security. The second approach is development-related interventions. The third approach is ensuring rights of local communities. And the fourth is perception management or media management. So friends, uh, for the first security, and, and whenever you are asked a question on uh, government of India's approach or government's approach, you need to remember these four points in your mind. So your answer will revolve around these four, these four points. So amongst the security interventions, friends, uh, you know, the, this law, there is the U UAPA under which the uh, Communist Party of India and its fund organizations have been have been banned under UAPA 1967. Then there are three government schemes, important security related. A lot of acronyms on this uh, uh, slide. I will try to, uh, uh, to, uh, to expand them for your benefit. But please pardon me because there was less space, so I could not uh, compress it. I could not expand it. So this is a security related expenditure in which uh, whatever expenditure a police force uh, in, uh, incurs in state police incurs in the in terms of strengthening the police station, putting uh, fencing, watchtowers, and all, uh, rehabilitating the center of uh, giving compensation to the killed persons, the civilians, and so on, that is reimbursed by the central government under this scheme. Then there is something called SIS scheme, special infrastructure scheme, in which uh, uh, a police station fortification and uh, some uh, infrastructure development work is taken up, and then there is this. Uh, Special central assistance scheme for LRU areas in which uh, critical gaps in infrastructure, for example, some roads or some critical gaps, they are they can be made under this uh, under this SCS scheme. These are all centrally sponsored schemes. Then uh, security intervention also has this. Uh, the central government provides Cobra and CAPF and India Reserve Battalions. Uh, Cobra is a part of CAPF. CRPF sorry. CAPF maybe in uh, Cobra is a part of CRPF. And other CAPFs like, uh, for example, ITBP, for example, BSF, they are also they are also deployed in LWE areas. And IRBN is India Reserve Battalion, in which the cost is borne uh, by the state and the central government. They are shared by the central government. State. So basically, IRBN and the central government uh, bears the initial cost, and the state government pays the subsequent cost, the running cost. So um, also important is defense of police stations. So uh, proper wiring, fencing of police station, proper lighting, so that noise are not able to immediately enter and attack the police station. Putting watchtowers, putting putting concertina fencing. Uh, so and then spending the camps, then improve improved intelligence operations, and then there is Samadhan doctrine of uh, the Ministry of Home Affairs that also is these. Are, so these four five steps you can write for security related interventions, and then moving to development related interventions. Better roads, making of roads, skill development, employment generation, infrastructure development, schools, healthcare, commission development, putting mobile towers. Then this is a backward regions grant fund. So most of these regions are backward regions, and there is this fund called backward region grant fund by the central government. So this can be uh, this is used in these areas. RRP is road requirement plan through which these roads are made in those areas. And there is something called the aspirational district program, 
in which I think 35, uh, I think 35 districts, 35 most affected LWB districts have been selected for integrated development uh, at, uh, uh, in, uh, so that is uh, what is the aspirational district program. Now moving to the third, uh, third prong, which is ensuring rights of local communities unless and until friends, the communities are um, satisfied, the communities, the, their grievances are, uh, are, are to an extent, uh, uh, their grievances are addressed. Uh, this grievance remains and it will be used by the Maoists for their own nefarious purposes. So it is important for us to uh, ensure that the local communities, their rights are, uh, and what are these rights? These rights are forest uh, rights, uh, rights over minor forest produce. They need to be given food safety. The public distribution system in those areas needs to be strengthened. We should work for job creation using NREGS, using infrastructure development, creation of roads, police uh, 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 recruitment to police from those areas. There is something called the Bastaria Battalion in CRP in which the recruitment has taken place from those areas. Also in many other states, they have followed the same thing. Uh, then again, we have uh, a recruitment of volunteers and also what this recruitment and this thing does is that, you know, it 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 it, it, it takes the youth and puts it in productive in the forces and you get a lot of local information from there. And uh, uh, the, 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 the youth is employed productively. So the Maoists, they, uh, so if the youth is employed productively, and, uh, they will be. They will not be diverted towards Maoist, Maoism and other uh, such uh, problems. So basically, you have to work for in, in give, giving employment to those areas and ensuring that the local people's rights are uh, given to them in, in terms of forest, in terms of uh, food, in terms of jobs, and so on. And of course, the last one is public perception management, friends, in which uh, in which government uh, government reaches out through the media, or through the radio, documentary, pamphlets, civic action programs, of course. Reaches out to the, tries to reach out to the uh, people and uh, it uh, tries to bring out the actual face of the Maoists, their actual agenda. Because people in the villages, they, they, they may not understand that the actual aim of uh, Maoists is to capture state power. They may think that they are working for our benefit. So to expose their uh, actual uh, dynamics and to expose their actual uh, uh, aim, this is the uh, this is the prong of public perception. So I hope this uh, slide will help you in writing answers on government of India's approach. The next slide, friend, is uh, how has this uh, evaluation of the government response? So, friends, you have seen that uh, the LWE influence has halted or uh, the area has contracted. And in 2011, it was 2,203 districts in 20 states. Now it is only 70 districts in uh, 10 states. And LWE incidents and casualties have reduced significantly. If you see the figure, the figure are given in the, uh, in, from on the, on, the, on the MHA website or even in the book I have included a table. So I'm not going to put the table here for a uh, lack of space, but uh, you can refer to the book. So uh, the figures are have reduced significantly and arrest and utilization of top leadership and cadres, surrender of cadres and dis disillusionment. Uh, so once uh, once a cadre is arrested or killed, a lot of cadres, they're out of fear or out of maybe understanding that uh, it is a futile agenda, it's a futile ideology. A lot of them, they again, uh, they get dis disillusioned with the LW ideology and they surrender to the government and government tries to rehabilitate them by giving them uh, in the package, relief really package, and so on. Uh, uh, then again, also uh, the performance indicator of those states have also increased. A lot of a uh, uh, lot of states on the development front they have done well. They have made roads in those areas. They have made uh, better public uh, health delivery and education delivery in those areas. So these things have had. Uh, so LWA has not been formed in LWA. The problem has not evolved in one day, and the solution will not be there in one day. But it's a long uh, haul. So states have uh, tried to. It, it, the performance of states have been good. These indicators, but uh, again, there are some concerns. For example, Maoists do retain their uh, strength in the core areas. For example, in Abushmar, For example, in uh, and that is where all the uh, attacks and all you will hear in the news. They have to keep on happening. And then in these areas also, there is an absence of roads, communication network, and limited governance uh, in those areas because of which uh, uh, the Maoists are still strong in those areas. But efforts are on and. And hopefully, in a few in a, in, a, in a few years, this problem will be uh, in a much uh, in the government or the Maoists will be in a Maoists will be in a much uh, reduced weaker position than they are now. Already, they are quite weak, but in future, they will be even further uh, reduced in area and stuff. So, what are the challenges that the government faces uh, in countering LWE friends? So, you have seen the government's approach, but what are the challenges that the government still faces? You see most of these areas in which uh, the Maoists are there. I will go to the, a few slides back. And so you see these are the tri-junction areas. These are the areas in which uh, there are the junction of three states. 
Odisha, Chhattisgarh, and maybe here you see uh, it's Telangana, uh, Chhattisgarh, and uh, Odisha. Uh, here it is uh, Gadchiroli probably, and Chhattisgarh, and then again Telangana. This is somewhere Odisha, Chhattisgarh, and uh, Jharkhand. This is uh, West Bengal, uh, Jharkhand, and then Odisha. So some of these areas are tri junction areas. And others are uh, others are uh, by junction areas of the, the two states. So especially in these tri junction areas, it is difficult because once the Maoists are say attacked in this area, they will escape to if they are attacked in this area. They will escape to this area. Sometimes they are attacked in this area, or the police forces uh, pursue them in this area, then they will run away to this area. And now since law and order is the state subject, so the proper coordination uh, among the three state forces becomes difficult. Sometimes the governments are of different political parties, and so. You will see in the tri-junction areas, it is uh, these these issues are uh, these issues do happen. Sometimes there are there are coordinated operations with with three states or two states, and there are coordination mechanisms at the highest level, uh, at the home ministry's level also, and at the CM's level also. But then these are the um, concerns that I was flagging that uh, at times uh, poor interstate coordination, uh, especially in bordering areas and tri-junction areas. The ineffective coordination between CAPF and state police force. You know, CAPFs they they are better trained, they are better equipped, they have better weapons, they have better fighting capabilities. But state police, even if they do not have better equipment capabilities, they still have better intelligence. So if the two of them could work in tandem and together, they would get give better results. But sometimes the coordination is uh, not optimal because of which uh, uh, the operational response is not to, up to the mark sometimes. Then poor socio-economic infrastructure. Still, in some areas, there are no roads and there are development lack of development facilities because of which uh, these are the challenges. Government is, governance is not able to reach in those areas because of which our response has been poor. And there are other challenges. For example, media, human rights. Uh, lo, uh, the forces may not know the local topography, but the Maoists they are from those areas and they know the local topography better. So these are the other challenges. Uh, media sometimes portrays uh, the police or the government government in a negative light. Even the human rights body sometimes uh, they are also the front organizations of uh, of uh, most organizations. So naturally they have their own agenda. So these are challenges that the government faces uh, in countering models. El and then these are the suggestions, friends. Basically, the suggestions are on the same four point strategy. So point number one to say I think uh, nine they are security related points and ten is ten to I think ten and eleven are development related points and twelve and thirteen are Ensuring rights and entitlements, and then 14 is media management and <coughs> sorry, <coughs> perception management. So just be specific in the session, like continued reliance on multi-pronged strategy and improving operational capability of security forces. I'm just reading it out. Strengthening of defense of police stations, outpost camps, opening of police uh, camps at short distances. Because once you open a lot many camps, uh, the, the 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 freedom that the Maoists in those areas, the freedom is reduced. They are not able to move long distances. Uh, they don't know there might be an ambush somewhere. So uh, opening camps at regular distance also is important uh, 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 in reducing the area of influence of the Maoists. Then again, training, motivation, modern equipments to security forces, SF plans for security forces, intelligence-based operations, recruitment of local youth as civic volunteers, college police volunteers, police uh, forces in CAPF, and so on. Then encouraging surrender and rehabilitation of Maoists, winning hearts and minds, not violating human rights because once you violate a human right, once a civilian is killed, the same point is drummed up by the Maoists and they try to form a movement against that killing and then it brings, it takes the security forces back and then they try to gain a uh, foothold again in that area. So at all costs, civ civilian casualties have to be avoided. Then again, uh, roads, communication and social development uh, in those areas, financial inclusions, banking, credit facilities in those areas, food security through PDS, improvement of agricultural productivity, jobs, and so on, ensuring rights and entitlements in terms of land, forest produce, and effective perception media management. So I think uh, the same four points you have to write uh, slightly more specifically in case you are asked to give suggestions in the exam. So that brings to the end of uh, LWE, friends. I'm sure after this, uh, you'll be able to frame the answers in your mind, whatever questions are posed. We'll take a one minute water break and we'll start with, uh, with, with uh, for the next 20 minutes, we'll study, uh, I think, uh, Northeast. Alex, uh, mm, is the speed okay? Yes, yeah. this is fine, sir. This is fine. I think you have covered a lot of points also. Uh, can we take one or two questions uh, from this topic? Just while the students are uh, having a glass of water. Yeah, that would be better. 
yes, when we have some questions already in the chat uh, i mean if somebody wants to use the voice option uh, please raise the hands i can uh, i mean okay I, i'm you. just i'm just scrolling a few questions let me see i'll uh, i'll answer all of the questions uh, your voice is low somebody said uh, i hope i was audible throughout uh most of the questions most of the comments are regarding voice but uh, i think how to make flow chart in disaster management uh, so i'll come to the slide i have a flow chart so you need to uh, 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 there, there is a flow chart at the end of the uh, this presentation so perhaps that will help you a little bit uh, how to counter a question when we cannot recollect adequate information about a certain dimension of a question for example role of specific national strategy or institution so uh, one one trick that one trick that i can tell you friends is uh, if you remember the uh, uh, if you remember the syllabus try to remember the syllabus of anything uh, for example it can be helpful in your optionals also so just remember what are the in case you are not able to frame a question uh, in case you are not able to exactly Uh, frame a question just remember what are the mm, contents of syllabus i'll give you an example okay just see this question uh, analyze the multi dimensional challenges posed by external state and non state actors to the internal security of india also discuss measures required to be taken to combat these threats Now suppose you have absolutely no clue, or uh, you have little clue to answer. Bro. What you can do is just try to remember what were the chapters in my book, or in any in any book on internal security. So you are asked about multi-dimensional challenges posed by external state and non-state actors. So at least two things you understand: multi-dim it has to be multi-dimensional, and it has to be by external state and non-state actors. By external state you mean China, and by non-state actor you mean uh, by China, Pakistan, and so on. And by non-state actors you mean uh, ISI groups like terrorist groups, uh, all these groups. so at least these three four things to understand now you go to the syllabus so lwe may is there any role of uh, terrorists or not i, I don't think much but they, they themselves are a type of uh, is it itself is a type of terrorism just go to the syllabus previous slide right yeah this one so you think uh, you see uh, northeast yes uh, there are arms movement from uh, from china chinese arms come through this uh, from the myanmar border the myanmar border is open you can write about the uh, the entry of arms and ammunition uh, through the terrorist groups in myanmar to the terrorist groups in india you can write about this, uh, that uh, from northeast there is there any other point uh, role of external state and non state actors yes uh, in 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 arunachal pradesh they are trying to uh, form villages near uh, near the border in Arun on the chinese side uh, near the border in arunachal pradesh so the non state actors are trying to and thus they are trying to create pressure on the border Uh, in in Arunachal Pradesh, so you can include that point. In Jammu and Kashmir, yes, of course, uh, there are tensions on on the line of actual control by by China. There are tensions, there are infiltration, terrorist attempts, uh, attacks, uh, terrorist attempts and attacks uh, on the line of control uh, in Jammu and Kashmir. So um, yeah, you can include this point. Uh, the role then role of external state and also this is the question itself. Challenges from media and social media. So is there anything that uh, China or maybe uh, in on uh, it's not there but maybe in this uh, there are a lot of uh, cyber security challenges in mainland china a lot of pakistani uh, there are hackers uh, who act actually attack government sites so you can write about uh, the uh, uh, the uh, there are terrorist groups or maybe hacker groups who are keep on attacking uh, these uh, indian websites and defacing them trying to attack uh, uh, our grids and trying to cause big cyber attacks uh, data theft and also on so that is something that you can write uh, so uh, uh, if you remember cyber security challenges then money laundering yes of course uh, sometimes money is laundered through hawala channels through pakistan maybe through by the means of sending uh, sending uh, ndps narcotic drugs uh, drugs by the means of uh, you know uh, fake currency by the means of arms and ammunition uh, uh, trafficking through the border then you will have to remember security challenges at border area so on myanmar border on china border border challenges you can just think of this then is there a problem with postal security yes of course the 26 11 attacks were held to postal routes so uh, and terrorist are attacks so sometimes they do you can write sometimes they do try to attack to the postal uh, routes also so that thing can be can give you one point 
then organized crime and linkage with terrorism uh, organized crime means uh, crimes like uh, money laundering uh, crimes like uh, uh, fake indian currency notes uh, crimes like arms ammunition trafficking uh, human trafficking so all these things are linked with terrorism and all that that linkage will you, know, you already know or you will read in this chapter on say this thing so that can be included here and most and you see in most of these the group the terrorist groups have linkages with the organized crime so one provides protection and the other provides money to the terrorists and terrorists provide protection to them sometimes they are the same people so this thing can come here uh, then uh, security person and uh, security agencies no afspa and some issues no it is not relevant communism and mob violence sometimes uh, uh, communism it may not be exactly relevant here india has no nuclear doctrine is not relevant here so i think uh, you have already got uh, 10 12 points in, on which you can frame an answer if you just remember the syllabus of the subject and this is true for any uh, any uh, any subject so i hope to some extent uh, i have have been able to answer your question uh, so in case you are in doubt try to remember try like, to recollect the syllabus what is there in the syllabus and try to link it from those uh, from those uh, points now friends uh, i am short of time so uh, alex should be move to the next part uh, not east yes sir please i i hope you'll pardon me for uh, exceeding my time that won't be a problem so friends uh, this is uh, uh, the, we are going to the next part uh, i I'm, i'm sure uh, after having understood the dynamics of maoist extremism if you go through the book then you will able to gather more and uh, once you understand the story then when you read the paper or when you read the newspaper you know you know the background you can link and therefore my my aim here in the northeast also is to do the same to make you understand give you a gist of the issue so that you know when you read a article when you read the book when you read a chapter when you read a news in the northeast you are aware of these three four of the of the underlying challenges which will help you answer the understand the topic better so let's first uh, recap what let's first see what are the questions friends uh, the northeastern region of india has been infested with insurgency for a very long time analyze the major reasons for survival of armed armed insurgency in this region in this region 150 words 10 marks Human rights uh, activists constantly highlight the view that Armed Forces Special Powers Act 1958 is a draconian act leading to cases of human rights abuses by the security forces. What sections of AFSPA are opposed by the activists? Critically evaluate all the requirements with reference to the view held by the Apex Court. So it was in uh, 2015, 12.5 marks. Though AFSPA have not covered specifically in this lecture, but there is a separate chapter in the book on AFSPA, entire chapter on, on AFSPA. I will touch upon it in this lecture. so uh, moving to the next slide friends i want to see i want you to see this slide uh, though it is slightly uh, blurred uh, but just see there are so many kind of uh, people on the slide so the point that i am trying to make friends is that now uh, uh, that, that northeast is a is a is a region of immense diversity it is a region in which uh, there are about 200 tribes live there and uh, they they live they have been living there since ages they have their different cultures their different aspirations their different customs their different ways of life and so uh, yeah, so each of these uh, tribes have their aspirations and there are 200 tribes and i think uh, more than 400 languages are spoken in the so it is one of the most diverse region regions in india perhaps the most diverse regions in india and this diversity is to some extent also responsible i not say responsible but is an is a cause or underlying cause or it it is linked to the persistent and persistent under development and extremism in that area and the subsequent slides will explain you how friends uh, look at this slide this says uh, tribal population diversity in the northeast and see the these figures may not be uh, uh, may, may be slightly old figures but this is the percentage and percentage is by large will remain the same So look at in Nagaland, there are 90% tribal people. Angami, Aur, Lotha, Sumi, Sankram, Cham, Kiam, Nyungan, Kumiak, and so on. In Mizoram, 95% of them uh, are uh, tribals. Dusai, Mar, Paite, Pavi, Mara, Bon, Lau, Rante, Pang, Gualunpo, and Baite. 64% are Arunachal, Galong, Nishi, Bancho, Adi. Assam, it is lesser, lesser, but still there are pockets in which uh, the distribution is uh, higher. Oros, uh, Karbi, Koch, Rajbongshi, Mishing, Mishma, Rava, and so on. And the 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 figure varies for the rest of the states. So the point I'm trying to make is uh, that the tribal density is high in these uh, states in the northeastern states. 
So, uh, friends, uh, what are the causes of insurgency in Northeast? And before I go on the causes of insurgency, I will just move to the next slide and look at this slide. This slide, uh, and before before I even start on Northeast, uh, uh, friends, uh, Northeast comprises of seven states uh, and also Sikkim. So, there are total eight states and not only seven states. So, those seven, seven states are Assam and the six sisters, for example, uh, Meghalaya, Arunachal Pradesh, Nagaland, Manipur. Mizoram, Tripura, and Sikkim. So, Sikkim also is a part of the uh, Northeast. So, there are eight states in the Northeast and not seven, contrary to uh, some, uh, to some, some of you might be confused, but there are eight states and not seven. Sikkim also is a part of the Northeast. So friends, uh, I will go state by state here and try to give you an understanding of what are the insurgent uh, movements going on. You see here there is Bangladesh border. This is Bangladesh border, and this is an uh, quite, this was an open border earlier. Now a lot of it is fenced, but earlier this was an open, so people could uh, move from this region. They could also go from this region to Tripura and all. Uh, so from this to mainly to Tripura and so on. This was an open border, uh, so they would go from here to this these places. And gradually, when people shifted, a lot of people, uh, a lot of uh, non-indigenous people uh, went to. Uh, Assam and the uh, ship and uh, and they settled there and this caused uh, this uh, this brought the local economy and the local resources under a lot of stress and then this led to the rise of the first extremism that is uh, in the 1979 1978 by the all Assam states union and they they raised this banner of revolt and uh, they, they tried to they this uh, they protested against it and which led to the Assam agitation of 1979 to 85. And it was in 1985 or 86, 85 that Rajiv Gandhi had signed. So then Prime Minister uh, Rajiv Gandhi signed an accord with the with the All Assam State Union, States Union, All Assam Students Union, in which uh, basically uh, they, they had decided to end the insurgency in that area. And uh, uh, basically, it was a package in which uh, water fence was to was to be constructed. Then again, uh, there were two dates: first of January 1966. So people who had come to this uh, Assam before 1st January 1966, they were to stay, they were to stay in Assam and they were to get voting rights also. And those people who had come into Assam after uh, 24th of March 1971, they were to be uh, found out and deported out of uh, this into their original place, from, perhaps from Bangladesh. If they had come, they would have been sent back to Bangladesh. So these two dates were important. 1st January 1966, people before uh, coming to Assam before that. They were to remain, they were to get voting rights also. And people who had come after 24th of March 1971, they would be removed, detected, deported, and their names would be deleted from the voter list. So that was the thing. And those people who had come in between these two uh, dates, they would be allowed to remain, but they would get voting rights after 10 years. So this was the Assam Accord, and this was the Clause 5 of Assam Accord. And Clause 6 gave certain uh, privileges uh, to the to the indigenous people of Assam. So all those people who had come from way back from say 1951 or 1947 up to 1966 or 1971, they would be, uh, so it was, but it, uh, so so they, these people had, had added to the indigenous population. So certain safeguards were given to the indigenous population who were there before, uh, since earlier. So when was this earlier date? To a recent commission of Justice B.K. Sharma committee, uh, it has said that they will take 1950, it has recommended that they, they will take 1951 as the cutoff date for uh, determining who are the in, indigenous inhabitants or who are the, uh, the uh, indigenous inhabitants of those areas and they will get certain benefits in jobs and so on. So that is about clause 5 of, uh, the, that is about clause 6 uh, of the Assam Accord. So these two clauses are important, clause 5 gives two dates and clause 6 gives certain benefits for the indigenous uh, inhabitants of the of Assam, uh, for which that cutoff date has been proposed to be 1951. So this agitation, uh, a splinter group of that uh, was formed. So Ulfa, uh, Ulfa, Ulfa uh, independent was a splinter group, which, which again, it did not uh, agree to these demands and it has continued struggling. Say it, it was not satisfied with the package and it has continued to fight. So it is a banned organization under the, under the UAPA. So that is uh, about uh, this uh, Assam. Uh, then again, you know, in the northern bank, this area, there is a group called the Bodos. Uh, Bodos are the largest tribal community of Assam, and uh, they are they are about thirty percent. Sorry, they are about six percent of the population of Assam. But in this area, in this area itself, they are about thirty percent. So they are the largest tribes, but they are not the um, majority of the population. So this agitation started in nineteen. 
90s uh, early 1990s so there have been three accords in the first accord first accord, so what they want is they want uh, assam to be divided 50 50 between uh, the bodos and the and the and, and assam so uh, that was their main demand but uh, in the first accord in i think 1993 uh, a bodo uh, bodo autonomous council was formed bsc and some rights over local self governance and all was given to them then again in 2000 then again what happens in generally with these groups is that once uh, the government signs an accord with with say two three groups then some other group will form or some other group will, will get disgruntled and they will again start uh, insurgency and they will say that no we are not happy with that agreement and then our demand is so and so so and then they, then they will increase there some more demands so this is the general pattern which you will find in uh, many of these insurgent groups so uh, another uh, faction of that uh, they started protesting and then then there was something called ndf in uh, national democratic front of uh, bodoland so they started uh, agitating and then in 2003 another accord was signed in which the bsc which was in formed in the first bodo autonomous council it was made in uh, btc bodo territorial uh, council so btc was given the six schedule status in the second accord so it was brought under a six schedule and then again there were some uh, groups uh, for instance as i have told the majority is not the bodo but majority is 70% are non bodo and then non bodos they said they thought that we have not been consulted and our rights are violated in these areas we are not given adequate rights and all so they also started protesting sometimes the bodos also thought that no our actual demand has not been fulfilled of these are assam so again they started protesting and recently in 2020 2021 uh, uh, i think perhaps 2020 uh, i think it's uh, 2021 in 2021 uh, another third bodo uh, agreement was signed in which uh, now the bodo territorial uh, council has been made into a bodo territorial region and in the council there were 40 members it has been increased to 60 they have been given more powers they have been given more subjects upon which they can uh, uh, they can they can work so their ambit has been extend, expanded so and 1500 1500 cadres of ndfb have surrendered and uh, and 1500 crore rupees package has been given to them so hopefully now this problem a uh, uh, bodo issue has uh, hopefully it has been resolved but again it has been, it has been the pattern in northeast that uh, say when three four groups uh, so four factions of bodos have uh, joined hands in this agreement uh, of 2021 but uh, but but uh, we we hope that this will bring lasting peace to the region but sometimes it has been seen that one once a group uh, once a group uh, uh post for agreement with government of india another splinter group springs up and so far it has not uh, it has not happened in the case of uh, borderland but we hope that this problem will be resolved has been resolved in the in the future or will be resolved in the future so the latest agreement is of 2021 in which a 15 crore package has been given and lot of other facilities have been have been given it's there in the book i am just giving some of the brief ideas friends this is this region is uh, meghalaya uh, but before that i will come to this region which is called uh, karbi anglong this is a region uh, karbi anglong district it is one of the most uh, backward districts in assam uh, it is also a melting point of uh, various uh, tribes and communities at least about 50 60 different kinds of tribes live there and each one of them have their own uh, have their own aspirations so karbi anglong is actually a, a, an autonomous council under the six, under the six schedule which is called kaac and in this uh, karbi anglong basically um, the karbi anglong uh, in 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 this the, there are the kukis who want a separate regional council for themselves in which uh, there are the rengma nagas who want a different uh, council for themselves and again there is uh, there are other group called such as uh, uh, one other another group called the uh, dimasas so dimasas they want a separate state so dimasas are actually residents of dimasa district here near karbi anglong but they want a separate state so many of these groups they want separate states so or maybe they, they want better facilities for them they want some want some autonomous council some want a separate state some want a nation like the nagas and so on so because of these various tribes and their competing aspirations this uh, they, they these these problems are there moving to uh, so this is about north uh, this is about assam i have spoken about three of the problems then in uh, in this is uh, this is nagaland this nagaland insurgency is the oldest insurgency in india since 1947 or 48 when 1946 uh, 47 uh, the naga nnc was formed in 1946 naga national council and it had given a deputation to lord mountbatten regarding the and proposing the future state of uh, Uh, how they would in the future uh, administer so that they had of course lord mountbatten also and it is from that time that this, 
that this dispute is lingering. So in Nagaland, in 1954 or 5, they had formed an underground government. They had formed a Naga Federal Army, and there's a person called Pizo. He led the revolt. But in 1958, to counter them, this uh, Armed Forces Special Powers Act had been enacted. And since then, it has been uh, there in the... Uh, so what? Uh, so I'll not go into specifics of uh, AFPA. But uh, later, this uh, Naga National Council, it, 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 it uh, signed an agreement with the government in 1970. But uh, some of the groups were dissatisfied, so they formed a splinter group that is called the NSCN, Na Nationalist Socialist Council of Nagaland. 1980 it was formed, and Isaac uh, and Muiva, they were the two leaders. Uh, so initially, they were not the, initially uh, this. Uh, again, in 1998, these groups, uh, or I think in 1989 or 90s, uh, these two groups uh, uh, split into two parts. So Kaplan faction is one, and the other one is uh, the Isaac Muiva faction. So Basically, what the Nagas uh, the Nagas want is they want a separate nation of their own. So they 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 say that all the Nagas of this area, Nagaland, as well as this part of Arunachal Pradesh plus this part of Assam plus this part of the hill parts of uh, Manipur and also some parts of uh, Myanmar, they want to integrate all these and call in, call it the Greater Nagaland or Nagalim. So the current area of Nagaland is sixteen thousand five hundred kilometers, but this entire Nagalim they want to form a nation of their own. Of about uh, about uh, one lakh twenty thousand square kilometers, but the neighboring states, for example, Assam and uh, Arunachal Pradesh and Manipur, they don't want any change in their boundary. So uh, so this uh, this thing is there. Recently, in 2015, the government of India has, had signed a framework agreement in which uh, the government recognized their uniqueness of history and their aspirations. Uh, but at present, the uh, discussion is pending on the question they want a separate flag and a separate constitution of their own Tanaka. Uh, representatives, but uh, government of India is not willing to uh, concede this demand, and rightly so. So this is uh, this is pending at that uh, uh, at, at, at on the question of separate flag, and they call it Yezabo. The constitution separate constitution, they call it Yezabo. So they want a separate flag and a separate Yezabo, but that's uh, uh, government of India does not accept this demand, and is pending at that level. So the Kaplan faction is banned at present, uh, and uh, it does indulge at times in attacks and all. But the Isaac Muiva faction of NSCN has been in ceasefire from since 1997. Recently, 25 years of ceasefire has just happened. This is the 25th year of ceasefire. Talks are going on, uh, but the talks are being held. Recently, what the government of India has done is, is that earlier it was only talking with the Isaac Muiva group of uh, this thing. But now it has um, expanded the ambit to include other civil society, other other some other uh, uh, Naga uh, insurgent groups, as well as civil society, is something called the Ho-Ho, which are the tribal bodies of them. So it has included some of the Ho-Hos and uh, there is something called the Naga Gaungura Foundation. So some of the civil society and other insurgent groups also have been included in these talks, rather than only speaking with the NSCN IP, I, IM, and this is what the NSCN IM does not like. So uh, that is the current status uh, of Naga issue. Friends, this is Manipur, and Manipur, uh, this this is the valley. Imphal is a valley, and they are surrounded on all, all sides by hills. The valley is mainly dominated by the Maithis, and uh, Maithis are basically followers of Hindu, Hinduism. And earlier, actually, this uh, Manipur was a princely state. In 1949, it actually acceded to the to India. Manipur and Tripura, Manipur and Tripura were a princely states, so it acceded. Manipur acceded in 1949. And uh, before, before that, the Maithis were the kings of that. So, so they thought that this merger is against uh, their uh, interest, or maybe they were forced to merge. That is what they think. And they want to go back to their old independence, uh, or they want to have autonomy, uh, or they want to go to their old uh, uh, state. So that is uh, what the valley-based insurgent groups want. And there are a lot many of them. And they keep on also fighting with the uh, hill-based insurgent groups. So valley is, uh, there are, the Maithis and the hills, there are the Nagas and the Kukis. So the Nagas keep on uh, fighting for uh, the Naga-based groups and the Kukis also keep on fighting with, uh, with the Nagas, also with the Maithis. So there are so many groups and I mentioned only a few of them. So each one of these tribes, they, they are saying that, okay, we are being attacked from other tribes, so we will need an armed force of our own. So some people, they form an armed force of the, these. So there are so many tribes and each one of them is trying to float an, an armed force of their own. So um, many of the many of times you see they 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 float these armed forces, but then they also start uh, indulging extortion and uh, and uh, collecting money and you know uh, doing all, all sorts of crime. So at times uh, the formation of uh, terrorist group or insurgent groups is also a cover for their own illicit and uh, criminal activities rather than for actual uh, political purpose. This is um, uh, this this is uh, Meghalaya. As such, there is no problem. There are two groups called. Uh, one is uh, the Hini trip, 
National Liberation Council at HNLC, and the other one is GNA, Garo National Liberation Army. So one represents the interest of the Garos, and the other represents the interest of the Khasis and Jantias. So at present, there is not much a problem in uh, Northeast in uh, in Meghalaya. In uh, Tripura, there is uh, this uh, group called uh, um, uh, All. Uh, I think uh, Tripura Liberation Tigers. So they had an agreement two years back with the government of India. By and large, it is peaceful. This is uh, Mizoram. Mizoram had an insurgency in the 1959 to 65. Uh, later in 1986, uh, they signed Rajiv Gandhi signed an accord with uh, the then uh, Lardinga, Mr. Lardinga, who then became the chief minister. And this violent insurgency was uh, was finished. At present, it is a peaceful state. There are some refugees who are called Bruce who have uh, gone from uh, Mizoram to Tripura and uh, recently there was an agreement on, uh, on permanent settlement of the Bruce refugees uh, in Tripura. They have been given a package like house and some stipend and so on. This was just about uh, an year ago. So the Bruce refugee problem uh, from this uh, part uh, from Tripura to uh, from Mizoram to Tripura. So friends, uh, these uh, Naga militants, they also sometimes sneak into this area. And you know this border is open. This border is open. In, in the, in, it's called a free movement regime. There is no fencing on this border except for a small portion here uh, near Moray border. But otherwise, this is a, by and large a hilly and forested area, and uh, this is open. Uh, so people can come in, go out. This is called a free movement regime in which, for up to 16 kilometers on each side of the border, people can go without a need of a visa. So local people here can go go on this side and this side. And sometimes the uh, without any visa and they, they just need to have a travel document which is valid for one year and they, when they can go they can stay for 15 days at a stretch two weeks at a stretch <clears throat> so when the insurgents are pursued here they come and they run to this side sometimes when they are pursued here they also run, run to this side so this is an open border uh, the free movement regime and this also uh, is also is responsible for uh, the movement of arms and ammunition the movement of uh, narcotic drugs, uh, drugs and so on and that. So once you, if you are asked a question on uh, this border's uh, uh, problems, then you can mention about these FMR regime, free movement regime. You can ask about insurgent groups being pursued here and running into this. You can ask, uh, you can speak about arms coming from China to this corridor into the Northeast, into India. You can speak about uh, the Myanmar uh, drugs coming from Myanmar, and all these things. So friends, that is a brief overview. Uh, in Arunachal Pradesh, by and large, it is fine, but there are two kind of refugees. Number one, Chakmas, who are actually Buddhist, and Hajong, they are uh, Hindu refugees. They had come from Bangladesh into this region, and the local tribes do not, uh, they, have, they do not want these tribes to remain there, so they sometimes keep on clashing with them. But this, they had come in 1960s, and now they are almost 60, 50, 60 old, year old, but then sometimes these disputes keep on happening. The Chakma refugees and the Hajong refugees. So Sikkim has, as such, no problem. I have covered almost all of the states. In the northeast, just to give you a brief overview, now you will now we will just summarize what are the types of conflicts. Friends, so you will see that there are national conflicts in which those groups want uh, a nation of their own. For example, the Nagas they want a separate Naga Lim. For example, the KLO Kamtapur Liberation Organization, which was somewhere here, the Kamtapuris. Uh, yeah, so they want a nation at this place, a Kamtapur nation. So uh, there are national conflicts, then there are sub-regional conflicts in which they are, for example, the Karbi Anglong, the the Cookies there want a sub-region of their own. Somebody wants, the Masas want a state of their own. So sub-regional conflicts. Uh, then there is the ethnic conflicts. I think the two, the, the Kukis and the Nagas, they keep on fighting in the Manipur. Uh, the, the Angamis and the uh, and the Kukis, they also fight in somewhere near uh, Karbi and Long. Uh, so, so there are various groups and they keep on fighting for their own interests and all. Then of course there are criminal enterprises. Uh, so all these, many of these groups are actually involved in extortion and gaining uh, control of resources rather than actually fighting for any political purpose. So there are purely criminal enterprises also, which in the name of a group, they form a group, and then indulge in terrorism, indulge in extortion, and so on. So friends, uh, these are the four types of conflicts, and there are also uh, and, uh, the causes are inter-ethnic mistrust and suspicion, protests against migration, like you see it in, so in Assam, control of resources in uh, Meghalaya, and they, they want to control the coal and all. So they, these groups are indulged in uh, extortion from businessmen in those areas. Then, of course, uh, there have been, because of this migration, there have been demands for separate nation, state, uh, autonomous district council, regional council, under six schedule, or some special facility for these tribes. Then, uh, violence, extortion, arms, narcotic smuggling, these are also causes because uh, some of these groups on the garb of uh, terrorism or in the garb of, uh, uh, of protecting their, their tribes' rights, they are actually involved in all these things. Then, of course, underdevelopment and unemployment, six schedule, uh, the ineffectiveness, uh, the benefits have not flown to the actual ground level people. 
a lot of people are still underemployed and, 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 and unemployed so underdeveloped and unemployed so uh, when people do not have job then they will they will naturally resort to all kinds of wrong things there also widespread feeling of exploitation alienation and otherness people of north east have still not been uh, we have not been able to, uh, uh, to integrate or rather there is still a uh, you know, psychological barrier somewhere uh, because of which people of the area do not uh, uh, feel that they have been neglected and then aspa is a factor because uh, when somebody a civilian is killed a lot of people get disgrunt disgruntled and disgusted with the law and they try to uh, uh, the militants take advantage of this issue of the aspa and then of course there is a the role of uh, external state and non-state actors china through its through its agencies is also trying to push into arms into these regions and try to foment trouble sometimes uh, uh, you'll see and they they are they are in touch with some of these leaders of the insurgent groups in these areas so the role of china though not direct uh, indirectly uh, it, 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 it is there uh, in 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 paresh barua who was the leader of ulpa independent he was protesting against the deployment of brahmos missile in assam so he was saying that if brahmos missile is there china will be forced to uh, attack but actually he must have been uh, speaking on behalf of or rather he must have been speaking uh, in china's interest if if the brahmos missile had been deployed uh, to counter the chinese threat but he was protesting why it has been deployed in assam so these factors point out that, that there is some role of an external state also in that region in fomenting the militancy in that area so uh, what are the causes of in, in, uh, underdevelopment trends the causes are the geographical terrain is, uh, is it is a forested and hilly ter terrain you have seen that uh, narrow siliguri corridor so uh, the siliguri corridor is about 22 kilometers narrow and if there is a communication problem in siliguri corridor the entire communication in the northeast gets hampered insurgency is there insurgency it retards development efforts people are not able to uh, put the development efforts insurgency also damages the existing infrastructure bridges and schools are blown up sometimes the train lines are cut and so on it also prevents the flow of good ideas investment innovation if there is no security a lot of people will not want to invest in those areas and also it damages the ecology fragile ecology of the northeast then there are governance issues uh, there is what are the challenges in tackling insurgency under development the challenge unemployment ethnic diversity china drug arms trafficking addiction so i'm just reading out these points so what are the government so now you understood uh, the background of insurgency and uh, development and under development in the northeast now let us see what are the government's provisions in the northeast number first and foremost is uh, uh, the constitutional provisions uh, for example the sixth schedule is there in which uh, uh, there are 10 uh, there are 10 uh, autonomous districts in the northeast in four states of assam meghalaya tripura and mizoram so constitutional provisions are there then these states are also SCS means special category states, and these states are uh, northeast states. All of them are called special category states. And what are these states? So 30% of the um, gross budgetary allocation of the government of India uh, it goes to the special category states. Uh, these are the northeast. Also, these are I think hilly states of uh, Jammu and Kashmir and Uttarakhand. So 30% of the gross budgetary allocation of government of India will go to the special category states, of which all the eight northeast states are. And moreover, in other states, the central government's ratio is 60, 40, sometimes 70, 30. But in these states, uh, because the state finances are not very strong, so only about 10% 10, uh, 10 is the state government's contribution and 90% is the central, government, central government's contribution. And then there are concessions in terms of income tax relief, tax reliefs, uh, moratoriums on interest, so various concessions for setting up industries. And then also these funds are non-lapsable. So in normally in other states, if uh, the government of India allocates, say, 10 lakh rupees in a year, uh, it, uh, on 31st March, if they don't use it, it gets uh, it gets it lapses. But in 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 the special category states, if it is if it is not used in that financial year, it it carries forward to the next financial year. So it is a non-lapsable uh, fund. So what are the security in, in the initiatives? Again, uh, a northeast division in the Ministry of Home Affairs is there. It it uh, talks. It, it it holds talks, negotiations, surrenders, etc. with the militant groups. Then it, uh, it it engages in dialogue, suspension of operation. For example, in Assam, Nagaland, Manipur, in these places, a lot of groups are under suspension of operations. Except in Assam, there is Ulfa Independent, and uh, in uh, Nagaland, there is NSCN Kaplang. And in Manipur, perhaps one or two groups might be there. But most of the groups in northeast, they are at present engaged in suspension. In their they are presently in suspension of operations with the government. Uh, then the government is, is involved in counterinsurgency operations in using the armed forces uh, and also the, the central armed police forces. 
the government also uh, helps with uh, there is the aspa which is uh, time to time promulgated by the central government or even by the state government then uh, there is this sri which has spoken about in the earlier uh, for maui so it is here in the northeast also security related expenditure irb and india reserve battalion is there surrender kick from rehabilitation scheme is there so it gives fund for surrender kick rehabilitation and civic action some of these uh, forces like cfpf uh, crpf etc they do their civic action in which they will go to villages and treat the people maybe they will the doctors will check the people maybe they will hold some kind of an educational mela or job fair or something like that so that they are you know they are able to win the trust of the people. friends now i go to the development related initiatives uh, yeah, the most important thing uh, at present is the government is trying to build lot of infrastructure in the area uh, in terms of road rail water links waterways airways airports power stations the dams gas grids and so on a lot of infrastructure projects are being Uh, made in fact uh, in fact as india's locust policy uh, wants to integrate uh, this northeast into a thriving hub with the other states in the other countries in the towards the east of india in that uh, respect there are two three projects uh, for example the kaladan multimodal transport project in which uh, uh, it will connect uh, it will connect uh, mizoram uh, to to the sea through uh, through a river in myanmar and to bay of bengal if i just go to the map this kaladan project will connect uh, this part of mizoram uh, through this sea to a port called sitwe in myanmar here and this sitwe port be, will be connected to kolkata port to ship so the transportation is, so it will number one give an alternate route to this chicken square chicken snake and number two it will make it faster so uh, otherwise you would have to go all the way from here to here to uh, here but now from this port to ship to this region called uh, sitwe and from there to river there is a river And then it will disembark at a point called Kalethwa here, and, uh, and then it will go by road to this Mizoram. So this is the Kaladan project. Then there is another project called uh, called uh, Akhara Agartala link. So Agartala is somewhere here in Tripura, and Akhara is somewhere here. So there is a bridge rail link between the two. And once this bridge the rail link becomes functional, this Akhara to Dhaka it will go, and from Dhaka it will go to uh, India. So that uh, you can uh, you don't have to go the Siliguri corridor, and directly from Tripura. Uh, you can come to kolkata and you reduce the distance so these are under various stages of uh, uh, hopefully near future it will agartala akhara link has been i think recently inaugurated by the prime minister so uh, i think about 6 months back i have to check the date the third project that i am so one i have talked about is uh, akhara agartala rail link i have spoken about uh, kaladan multimodal uh, multimodal because shipping is there shipping then again shipping is there then again by road so multimodal multimodal so inland water road and shipping so that is a kaladan project then there is another called asia india myanmar thailand trilateral highway so there is a highway which is will be formed from thailand to through myanmar into india and it will join the indian so all these projects uh, will in the future it will uh, will connect the northeast to the rest of uh, india as well as to the southeast uh, uh, asian countries uh, so that this region becomes it's very critically important for each region of india because number one it's vulnerable from this point and number two it's a, it has a big boundary with china and this boundary uh, uh, china also claims uh, this arunachal pradesh uh, so from that region and it it is like you know it, this region has uh, 98% if you take this whole region as a whole and uh, 98% of its boundary is with international country other countries so this is the bangladesh boundary this is the uh, myanmar boundary this is the china boundary this is with bhutan and only about 2 or 1 or 2% area is with the indian mainland that that is this region so that is the importance 98 to 99% of this boundary with other countries and therefore it is uh, very important for us to uh, uh, have number one alternate modes of communication and number two uh, yeah, this region's development is very important for the overall development of india so we have uh, covered uh, up to this uh, development related initiatives in such a development i have spoken about three four international projects also then of course there is the department of no department for ministry for development of northeast region donor and then there is the northeast council which is uh, for uh, headquartered in shillong and it is there for uh, the development of infrastructure and other projects in northeast for the overall socio economic development of the northeast and there is something called northeast special infrastructure development uh, corporation there is something called neramec which is for agricultural marketing northeast regional agricultural marketing corporation hh means handicraft and handloom so northeast handicraft and handloom development corporation and netp is northeast development finance corporation so these are some of the bodies which are uh, there for the development of the northeast 
course, border area development program is there, hill area development program is there in the hilly areas, and there are autonomous councils and regional councils in the northeast. Of course, government of India's activist policy is there, and the government is also holding northeast business summits and so on. So these are the government steps uh, for the northeast. Uh, Alex, uh, um, is it fine? Are the candidates, uh, the students, able to uh, follow a little bit? Or Yes, sir. Uh, it's a very information rich. Uh, I mean, your experience is reflected now throughout the presentation. Uh, uh, it's really, I mean, I wonder if everybody can comprehend everything you said in, in, in one and a half hours, but it's really information rich. It's, it's, it's my actually, my, my, it's my challenge that, uh, you know, uh, to make students uh, aware and retain their interest. So I'm trying, uh, let me, let me try my best. Uh, we have just uh, two or three more slides, friends. So just bear for five minutes more. So we will uh, now see uh, how far the government efforts have uh, are good or bad in the Northeast. How, what is the appraisal of that government effort? So friends, if you see the data, the insurgent activities are declining. They're showing a declining trend. Uh, if you see the data, the data is there in the book. I have not, but in all terms, in terms of surrender, surrender of militants, in terms of uh, agreements, in terms of talks with the groups, in terms of surrender, suspension of operations, uh, agreement with the insurgent group, in terms of ceasefire, in all these uh, uh, in all these terms uh, you see in terms of arrest of militants in terms of uh, militants killed uh, in all these uh, in terms of uh, incidents of violent incidents in all, on all these indicators you will see that uh, uh, that uh, it's it is a declining trend and uh, then aspa has been lifted in meghalaya in 2018 from tripura it was lifted in 2015 and recently after the moon killings in nagaland in last December last year, uh, it has been also lifted from some more areas, so uh, of Assam and uh, Mizoram, Assam and uh, uh, Assam and uh, Manipur and uh, Nagaland and Pradesh. So now the area has further strength, but nevertheless it is it has not been removed in total. There are reasons for that. Uh, then again, uh, of late uh, the, there is there has been the support of government of Bangladesh and the Myanmar also uh, against the insurgent groups. So they have said that they will not allow their land to be used against India uh, by the insurgent groups. So that support is there. Uh, in in recent uh, there has been ceasefire in 2019 with the National Liberation Front of Tripura (NLFT). So this group has already disbanded. There is peace in by and large there is peace in Tripura. Uh, in 2020, as I have spoken. Uh, Perhaps I mentioned 2021, so this agreement is of 2020. So the third Bodo agreement, which I mentioned, in which uh, they have made it the BTR, Bodo Territorial Region, in which the region has been extended, expanded to include 60 members, uh, and there are other facilities, including 1500 crore package and 1500 cattle have surrendered. All these things have been there in the Bodo agreement, and hopefully this agreement should bring lasting peace to the Bodo problem in uh, Assam. Then in 2021 September, as I have spoken, uh, Karbi Anglong agreement has been uh, signed. I am not uh, going the details, but they, they have given a package uh, to the Karbi Anglong, and uh, hopefully this will end the dispute in Karbi Anglong also. You can uh, refer to, uh, to the internet for the details of this agreement, or perhaps I will include, I am working on the second edition, and I will be including this in the second edition. And Naga talks, I have given you a brief overview. It is stuck on the point of flag. I have given you a brief uh, background. Actually, let me uh, talk a one or two lines more on Nagaland problem. What happened was that in 1946, uh, this Naga National Council was formed, and then there was something called a nine-point uh, nine-point formula. Uh, uh, so, in Nagaland, uh, then the at that time the um, government or the, the the NNC proposed that the government of India should and uh, actually the Assam gov governor was a person called Akbar Hyderi, and he he proposed. So it is also called Akbar Hyderi Agreement or the nine-point agreement, in which it was proposed that. Uh, that for 10 years after independence, uh, uh, this uh, Nagaland would continue to be governed by uh, India would act as, a, uh, act as a guardian power for Nagaland. But after 10 years, Nagaland would be, uh, NNC would be free to either continue with the same agreement or go for a new agreement. So the inter power, uh, let me add here that the Constituent Assembly did not ratify this uh, Akbar Hadri agreement or nine point agreement. But what happened was that at that point of time, uh, 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 the thinking was that after the Nagas interpreted that after 10 years we will get independence or we will we can determine our future course of action. Whereas government of India interpreted that uh, it only gives them the right that uh, after 10 years uh, they can choose to be to have a different agreement, but they, that does not give them the right to secede. However, there was this difference of interpretation between the Nagas and the Naga uh, NNC and the government of India. So they thought that after 10 years we become free. Government of India says that no, this agreement, this uh, nine-point agreement does not give you the right to secede. 
but it only gives you the right to go for a different agreement. So this uh, difference of opinion uh, in 1947 later led to all the, uh, the dispute which even persists till today. But now uh, the framework agreement has been signed and it is basically, uh, there are two points of difference. There is a flag in the constitution on which the government of India doesn't, uh, or uh, and rightly so, it doesn't uh, agree to uh, have a separate flag and portion for the Nagaland. So friends, uh, Naga talks, I have given you a brief overview. Uh, but despite all these things, there is still underdevelopment in the Northeast and insurgency is still there. Uh, we cannot say it has been insurgency free. A lot of people are unemployed. There is the state or the government, government has failed to provide the employment to the youth. And if there is large, large scale un unemployment, or if there is uh, unemployment, uh, though the government is making effort, but still it will take time. Uh, but we are on the right path and right track. Insurgency is on a decline. Government's efforts are being made. Uh, despite that, there is still uh, a lot of people are get, again to be unemployed, not employed. Unemployment is there, and people are, uh, you know, uh, there, there is still a feeling of deprivation, exploitation, isolation. So psychologically, this uh, this wedge for psychological divide still remains to an extent. So that is uh, the the result of government effort, government's effort in the northeast. Friends, uh, we can as suggestions we can give that we can give that. Uh, a holistic approach is needed. Problems. There are problems. Different. There are different ethnic groups have different problems, and we need to understand the different the groups' uh, own requirements. Peace dialogues, suspension of operations, ceasefire. These should continue because, however short-lived, but during that period, it gives the developmental agencies the the power or the opportunity to go in the area and work. So, if there is fight, if there is if peace is not there, operations. If there is, the militant groups are operating, the developmental agencies will not have opportunity to uh, to build roads, to make schools, and so on. So peace dialogue and suspicion operation should continue, but competency insurgency operations should continue against those groups which are not involved in peace dialogues, which are still uh, indulging in violence. For example, NSCN, Isaac Muiba, for example, or uh, rather, uh, rather NSCN, Kaplang, and Ulfa, uh, independent, and so on. So under uh, to the extent that they are, they come to the negotiating table. So competency operations should be carried out to that extent to force them to come to the negotiating table. But again, human approach is needed. If a lot of civilians are killed, then again, you know, it becomes counterproductive. Vigilance along the India-Myanmar border, India-Bangladesh border, because at times through these borders, many people have come and it leads to, it leads, it has led to insurgencies because of pressure on the local population. And India-Myanmar border, a lot of uh, illicit activities in terms of narcotic uh, trafficking, in terms of gun trafficking and all happens. So vigil along this border is essential. Sometimes the insurgent groups, they, they, they sneak through the India Myanmar border into Myanmar to deal along this border. Developmental projects have to be carried out, but of course, there is a need for uh, equity amongst various tribes, uh, social approval of the various tribes, and ecology. We cannot force those projects upon, upon, the, upon the population, but it should be a bottom up approach. Uh, modernization of primary sector uh, because uh, allied, allied processing uh, industry, organic farming, rural infrastructure, tourism, bamboo, because number one, these are all eco-friendly things, and now there is fragile ecology in the northeast. And number two, these are uh, sectors in which a lot of employment opportunities there. Uh, th uh, these are the actual sectors in which in which uh, the villages will be benefited. Large number of people will be benefited. So, uh, government's thrust is the government should uh, should focus on these sectors. Then statehood, where statehood can be considered, but it cannot be um, uh, it cannot be given on demand. It has to be seen whether it is viable as a state unit or not. But we should make efforts for preservation of distinct identities and efforts should be made for decentralization of power, including financial power. And then we have to work on strengthening of PRIs, local resource generation, because at large, uh, many a time, these uh, states are dependent on central government for uh, resources. So unless and until there is local resource generation, they will not feel confident. So we have to work on local gen resource generation also. Of course, government of uh, India's active policy is there. And, uh, we should work on preserving the distinct identities of the various people, and we should not try to mainstream uh, the Northeast. This term is a misnomer because all there are so many different kind of people, and there is no one solution for them. Uh, we should not. Uh, this mainstreaming is a misnomer, and we should not try to mainstream them. Rather, we should try to develop them to their fullest potential, or allow them to their help them develop to their fullest potential. Uh, at the same time, preserving their distinct identity. So recent issues, there are three, four recent, recent issues, friends, uh, mm, uh, two refugees, I have spoken that two refugees were uh, are of uh, money in Mizoram and they have, uh, in, earlier there were some violent incidents in 1997-98, so they had gone to neighboring Tripura and so they, had, they had lived since then at that place. Recently, last year, uh, January 2020, there was an agreement between the three states 
Tripura Central Government and the Mizoram, uh, through which they have been given a package and they have been allowed to, Tripura Government has allowed them to stay and become citizens and become residents of Tripura itself rather than going back to Mizoram. But originally they are from Mizoram. Then again, uh, recently there was an Assam border, Assam Mizoram border rule in July 2021, in which uh, six people were killed, six Assam police uh, personnel were killed. The origin of this dispute is uh, in two notifications, one of 1873, I think, uh, which is called Bengal Eastern Frontier Regulations, uh, in which uh, in which they uh, that border uh, that border uh, Mizoram claims that border, but Assam claims another border which is from a 1933 regulation. So this difference of perception has led to a border dispute between these two states, which at present is peaceful, but again, the dispute has not been resolved. Then Karbi Amalong agreement have said in September 2021, this agreement was made. So hopefully this has been solved. Mon civilian killings I have mentioned. Aspa area has been reduced after these Mon civilian killings uh, to now 31 districts. It is fully applicable and in 12 districts, it is partly applicable. And Naga police forces I have uh, spoken in detail. So, friends, uh, this brings me to the end of uh, Northeast, uh, and this is the last slide. I'll just rush through this slide. For disaster management, I have uh, mentioned that uh, uh, that uh, you have to know about the specific of disasters. You cannot uh, give uh, you 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 have to know about general. But having seen the questions, you have to also know about the specific disaster. Uh, for example, for landslide, the steps may not be relevant. Those steps may not be relevant for cyclone. So you have to know about the specific disaster. Please keep this chart in mind when a disaster strikes. These are the, the right, right side three boxes are post-disaster and these are pre-disaster. The left side three boxes are pre-disaster. Sometimes this mitigation and the reconstruction is not given. So there are four uh, in some books or in some places you have you find four response, rehabilitation, prevention and preparedness. So that is also correct. Uh, I have added two more. This is also correct. So uh, after a disaster, there's a response. So this response means immediate response. So searching rescuing people who are trapped, immediately giving them food, shelter, collecting the impact assessment, what has been the impact, how many people have died, what will be the resource, uh, what will be the resource mobilization, what funds are required, how many agencies are there, coordinating their efforts, uh, various agencies. So that is what is the immediate response. And then there is the rehabilitation. So suppose 5,000 people are injured, uh, many are so, then they have to be uh, temporary shelters have to be made. That is called rehabilitation. They you have to find temporary livelihood for them. Then there is the aspect of reconstruction. In reconstruction, you build back those infrastructure and build it better so that next time if a similar disaster comes, uh, so you have to write these terms, build back better uh, in, uh, risk reduction. So these are terms which the examiner will uh, like to see. So uh, the reconstruction phase is there in which you try to build back better. So if the if earthquake uh, has destroyed, so next time you build a house there, you make sure that the structure is earthquake resistant. Then again, integrating risk reduction, sustainable, sustainable livelihood in those regions. And then it is a cycle basically. So this it does not stop here. Then again, and for the next disaster, you keep on preventing. For example, in uh, for land for land landslides, you will uh, see land and land use planning. You have to do in what land you will do in some areas on uh, unstable slopes. You will not dig. You will rather make the slope stable. Then again, technical. For example, there are codes in coastal areas. In so much meter of coastal area, you cannot put a hotel or you can construct because of the fear of tsunami and all. So prevent uh, enforcement of building codes. Land use planning, technical prevention. Technical prevention means, uh, for example, uh, technical means uh, through the, for example, in in, in case of uh, a cyclone, if if you can you can put physical barriers in terms of trees or, or maybe dikes and dams and so on. So mitigation is reducing the risk. You cannot do away with the risk, but you have to reduce the risk. So for that, you have to identify the risk, analyze and minimize the risk. By for example, if the if an area is affected by floods. Then one of the reasons, one, one of the ways of risk mitigation is to shift the population from that area, from that flood plain into a slightly further area. You cannot change the course of the river, just shift. So by shifting, you have reduced the risk. And there are many other ways of risk uh, reduction. This is That is given there in the book, but I'm just going in short. And then of course, just before a disaster, you have to be prepared for that. You have to have early warning systems, emergency uh, planning, emergency planning, and so on. For example, these days, uh, now you know in advance, three, four days advance, the cyclone is coming and people are evacuated from those areas. We in the police, we get uh, time to prepare uh, our forces and uh, take necessary steps and so on. But in earlier days, uh, if the cyclone struck, a lot of damage would have been caused. But now if the cyclone strikes in our Odisha border or in West Bengal or other places, uh, the response is pretty good because of this early warning and uh, planning. So uh, I will conclude by saying that uh, you should uh, know about the specifics about important disaster and national and international 
national and state level laws and bodies you should know for example disaster management act 2005 national policy on disaster management 2009 national plan i am not saying that you have to know about each and every detail but just know that these are the important uh, guidelines for documents and know a little bit about these things then there is the national disaster management authority the state disaster management authority and district disaster management authority these are the apex bodies there is this national disaster response force and state disaster response force and there is national institute of disaster management for training in disaster management related things and there is the national disaster response fund state disaster response fund so you have to know about these things a little bit about these from any book you can read it is given in my book also so you can refer to that uh, i have given in detail i just mentioning in passing here and then international frameworks you can refer to yogo framework on disaster risk reduction and sendai framework on disaster risk reduction so there, there was a question to three years back on the difference between the yogo and sendai frameworks so friends uh, that brings me to the end of my presentation uh, this is uh, my last slide and uh, uh, so friends i am open to any questions